Now to today's conversation on hijacking decolonization, European Union in Central Asia through the lens of Russian propaganda. I'm going to base my talk on my own ongoing research. I have been researching Russia and Russian media specifically since 2015. And most recently, I completed a study in collaboration with the Institute for War and Peace Reporting and the project Kabar Asia, and also the Center for European Security Studies and the project Europe Central Asia Monitoring. Together, we wrote this report which is going to be released very soon on uh, the message sent and message perceptions uh, of Russian propaganda in Central Asia with the case of Kyrgyzstan specifically. So it's going to come from these two streams of uh, knowledge, let's say. Methodologically, I'm a qualitative scholar. I enjoy the inductive approach where you know I come in with no hypotheses, no expectations. Uh, as far as you know, testing some theory, but I collect the data and I allow the data to inform me. Uh, you know, to try to come in with as blank of a page as possible. And this is how theories are constructed. You know, this whole grounded theory approach developed by um, uh, Strauss and other scholars back in the 60s, 70s. <laughs> I also conduct discourse analysis. It, it began as a kind of study of language. You know, combinations of words, how we call something, but now it has grown into something much more than just, you know, language itself, because there are many ways through which we communicate. Uh, you know, symbols, uh, intertextual references, of course, you know, when you mention uh, some other texts, let's say other characters, persons, uh, storylines in your own plot, so that people find familiar ground, and, you know, you operationalize this culture code, uh, I also enjoy focus group discussions. Those are fun. <laughs> you know, you get to you get information firsthand, uh, and you know, people open up, and you have a conversation, which is all, always a joyful process. And you get information as a result as well. And something that I have been trying to apply increasingly is the ethnographic approach. Ethnography. The term is coined by Robert Kazinet back in the nineties. And this is a field that has also evolved. You know, it used to be simply defined as ethnography performed online, but now we live in the world where some of the groups, some of the formations that exist online have no offline equivalent. Some of the tools that are present online are unique to only that environment. So ethnography as a field has also evolved. I use it to scan social media groups, uh, chats, I deal only with open groups and open chats, you know, for ethical reasons. But I observe them. I'm a member of of uh, a few, and I just see, you know, who posts the news, let's say, or who posts the most. Uh, what is the role of the admin? So, based on these different methodological approaches, which all are uh, qualitative, I base my talk on. So, what is propaganda? Before we move on. We have to define it first, of course, and uh, you know there are many definitions to propaganda, just like there are to um, culture. But my own approach, I would say, I would say it's a multi-model, multi-semiotic, and multi-tool communication strategy, and it's aimed at impacting the way people perceive reality. Uh, a couple of illustrative images to support this claim, you know. So on the right here. Many people are living, you know, in Central Asia or maybe in the Baltic states, but mentally they're still attached to, uh, you know, their past to the USSR or to the, you know, the so-called mother state, <laughs> yeah, to the metropolis, if we talk with the uh, uh, colonial terminology, to Russia, to the Russian state. So they watch Russian media, they live in the Russian, so, you know, cultural circle, bubble, and but that's not limited to television, of course. Our architecture, the apartments we grew up in, you know, these Khrushchevkas, the streets we walk on that are called Sovietska or uh, Mira or Karla Marxa, you know, uh, city districts named after people like Sverdlov, for instance, yeah, or Dzerzhinsky. It's in the monuments that are still standing, like the statue of Lenin here in the center of Bishkek as people bow on, to pray on Ramadan. So it's quite the, the conglomerate of 
controversies and oxymorons here, Muslim people praying at the, you know, uh, beneath the father of the Bolshevik revolution and the founder of the atheist Soviet state in the city center in the independent Bish uh, Kyrgyzstan. So it is multimodal, you know, it comes from a variety of sources in a variety of forms and formats. And in my view, it impacts not just the way people think about a particular issue, but reality as a whole. It's, it's much broader. So what, is, what constitutes some of, you know, what are some of the other nuances for propaganda beyond this uh, definition? Well, it has to be discrete. You don't know that you are being subjected to propaganda. Usually, you know, you absorb it through cartoons you grow up with where it's explained to you what's good, what's bad, what the values are, the movies, of course, yeah, who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, who is fighting whom and for what values, some cliche phrases that we don't even notice probably that carry on propaganda in them, uh, or these linguistic structures, it's in the architecture, in the statues, and so on and so forth, like I've already mentioned. Propaganda has to be exciting. So quite often there are some conspiracies, for instance, yeah, like NATO uh, created robots that are spreading you know, COVID-19 around the world. It has to be, the more absurd it is sometimes, the, and the more exciting it is sometimes, the more believable it is, again, paradoxically. It has to be shocking, yeah, tragic children, old people suffering. If you look at the root of any, of the beginning of conflicts, Usually these images are presented to you. They, you know, they're attacking our kids, our women, our elderly, and so on and so forth. It has to trigger emotions, of course, those virtues, the patriotism, the us versus them mentality. Uh, you feel angered, you know, you read some propaganda material and you feel, wow, I have to do something. It's it has this, it triggers emotions and has this mobilizing effect. It does not have to be pure lies, so let's not confuse propaganda with uh, fake news. Moreover, media scholars discourage the use of fake news term because once you start tossing it around, around, you sort of devalue all news material. You know, it's a good tool for people like Trump because when the media criticize them and you accuse everyone of being fake, then there is a communal disenchantment and people start, stop believing anything. And sometimes that's what propaganda wants exactly. It doesn't have to be bad a priori. And for instance, you can propagate a healthy lifestyle. And I have a couple of images regarding that uh, here on the far left. Of course, you see the you know, tobacco causes mouth diseases. If you walk into the stores and you try to buy cigarettes, probably this is an image you see nowadays in most countries. But that was not always the case, of course. There is this evolution of smoking uh, ads. And, so, and it, interestingly enough, the father of public relations, Edward Bernays, uh, was the one who used propaganda to convince women to smoke. And back then, of course, in a, you know, a hundred years ago, the terminology was that is the torches of freedom. So liberation of women, emancipation of women was manipulated, was used as a tool to convince women to smoke and, of course, to increase uh, tobacco sales. So I, I'm using it as a vivid example. It's an interesting one, how it started, you know, as a propaganda tool, and then the term PR, public relations, was developed. But now we're back in propagating maybe uh, healthier choices. Why does Russian propaganda matter now that we have settled with definitions? It has a historical impact in uh, the post-Soviet space, let's say through its language, of course, in some countries like Kyrgyzstan, again, uh, Russian language has an official status in other countries like Uzbekistan. If, while it doesn't have an official status, it is referred to, as, there, it has an unofficial status of being an international language or the language of international communication, yeah? because you have the ethnic minorities and everyone who doesn't speak the so-called titular language, they can speak Russian with each other. Also in the region, you can speak Russian to each other. And these people are convinced to believe this way. So they say that you no know, Kyrgyz and Uzbek are so different from each other that you need to speak Russian as a common language. Something I would uh, fundamentally challenge and debunk, but it's present, it's there. This discourse is there, of course. It's in the humor, in these anecdotes, in the programs now with the stand-up comedians, humor experienced an evolution akin to the cigarettes as well. 
I would like to dwell on it if time allows. There are sentiments, nostalgia, you know, people, of course, are nostalgic for their youth, <laughs> therefore they're nostalgic for the USSR. Maybe with time, all of the uh, negative aspects are forgotten, like the shortage of food, the repression, uh, constant, you know, fear of, of saying anything, thinking anything, those things wither away and people start remembering how good the uh, kalbasa tasted. Of course, there are some uh, rituals and there are media rituals as well. When you gather in front of television in the evening and you watch your favorite shows, it has an aspect, an element of ritual to it. Entertainment and sometimes the newly established TV stations cannot compete with Russia something that our focus groups in this most recent research that I mentioned revealed as well. People are saying that, you know, we watch Russian media for its quality because there are a lot of, well, a, a lot of funding, of course, there is a lot of funding available and uh, content wise or maybe quality wise, yeah, local uh, alternatives have a hard time competing. And a certain culture code, of course, you know, those values, again, those fairy tales, cartoons, the movies, so central audience, Central Asian audiences are exposed to Russian propaganda both at home in their home region and in Russia. Uh, when they are in labor migration in Russia, it's a, you know presenting the precise number is almost impossible, but it's millions of people working in Russia. Migrants, so labor migrants are vulnerable in Russia. I have been tracking this vulnerability to this precarity caused by bad information, bad quality information. And, you know, people are tricked into buying fake permits, into hum being, you know, victims of human trafficking. But now they're also vulnerable to recruitment into joining Russian armed forces. They're promised easy passports. They're promised high salaries. Sometimes they're guilted into joining uh, the Russian military. They're sent both to fight in Ukraine and also to... Uh, work in construction in the captured territories. But European audiences are also exposed to Russian propaganda vastly, of course, uh, in the Baltic states, absolutely and definitely, but also elsewhere. In Germany, four to six million Russophones are subjected to Russian propaganda uh, directly. There is also an indirect influence when the far right um, narratives are spread around. And this is not to say that Russia is entirely to blame for these far-right sentiments in Europe. Of course, there are homegrown populist, nativist, rightist, you know, fascist even uh, formations and narratives. Absolutely, no doubt about it. But Russia is successfully instrumentalizing it and weaponizing these realities. Uh, European audiences are exposed to Russian propaganda online. There is a so-called ban on some of the key uh, broadcasters. I wouldn't call it a ban. It's more of a limitation of access. Uh, Sputnik, Russia Today, but many more are, are available and freely cruising around and uh, both uh, through television, radio, but also online, of course. pro Kremlin uh, <laughs> discourses penetrate through a variety of domains. Newspapers, books, websites, social media, people escaping mobilization, even, yeah, especially in, this is relevant for Central Asia, where hundreds of thousands of people running from mo mobilization in Russia, so they don't want to join the Russian army, they don't see themselves fighting in Ukraine, but maybe they don't necessarily oppose the war or Putin's politics. They come and they tell firsthand stories and people are thinking, wow, this person came from Russia, so I should believe them. Russia is an example of... Uh, uh, for repressive practices uh, for Central Asia leaders as well in this regard. So our presidents copy-paste some of the legislation concerning fake news, which is then instrumentalized to silence critical voices, to repress the already suffocating civil society, to put pressure on the journalists. And there's an interesting situation that I can also elaborate on maybe in, during the discussion point, but now the so-called West has high hopes for Central Asia in the sense that, hey, be friends with us to counterbalance uh, Russia's influence and maybe closing its eyes on some of the uh, violation of human rights, some of the repressive measures for the sake of not, for, for the sake of pleasing Central Asian leaders and convincing them of being friends with the European Union and with the NATO member states. 
However, in the meantime, Central Asian leaders maintain rather close ties with Russia, uh, openly or discreetly, symbolically or concretely, <laughs> traveling to Moscow for the uh, parade in the Great Patriotic War, May 9th, uh, that was just uh, that just happened, and also allowing Russia to go around to circumvent Western sanctions by you know playing a central role in that, and of course allowing Russian. Uh, citizens to come and engage in business activities and opening bank accounts and basically going around circumventing the uh, Western sanctions. So what is the process of hijacking the narrative? Yeah, it's a term that is used usually for stealing an aircraft and then using it as a weapon. Well, in a sense, Russia is stealing and weaponizing a narrative here because Russia is a colonial power. Russia, <laughs> terrorist Russia colonized, you know, Central Asia and after, and then arguably Soviet Union was also a colonial power and, you know, capturing lands. It was, a, it was no, no man, monarchy, but it was still a, a process of colonization where uh, you capture new lands, you extract the resources, you have the central government, the uniting language, you have the center, the Moscow, Russia, and then everyone else. And, and you know, if you analyze it, it is a colonial power. It, uh, yet, Russia will never admit that. It's not admitting it. It is trying to restore the lost paradise. It is trying to restore its uh, uh, the lands that it lost because according to Russia's narrative, all these countries that broke away accidentally, they, uh, they are a uh, natural continuation of Russia's borders. It's just accidentally because of the evil West, they became independent in 1991. And now Putin is portraying himself as the holy regatherer of, uh, you know, like, like the Saint Vladimir, who is the regatherer of Russian lands. Yet, the narrative is hijacked because Russia is using it to attack the uh, collective West instead with it. So Russia is hijacking the anti-colonial discourse to shield itself uh, from the colonial past. And in doing so, it maneuvers the anti-colonial narrative against the collective West. So this is what I describe as, in this case, as the hijacking of the decolonial, anti-colonial um, narrative. What are some of the key points in this regard? Well, Russian media did not arrive suddenly in Central Asia. It just never left. The Soviet Union collapsed, but Russian media remained, and it, it increases its presence now. It's massive. Yeah, Russian media penetration is huge. It dwarfs any other, uh, be it local or international uh, outlets, newspapers, you name it. It is massive. In some contexts, like in Kyrgyzstan, it is also state-sponsored because Russian media are rebroadcasted. So the state allows Russian media to be shown on television as part of the so-called social package. And the you know public discourse ar around it, the politicians are grateful to Russia for delivering their fantastic and expensive content uh, for free or nearly free of charge or, or at subsidized um, prices. We have to be aware of the convergence effect. We cannot just limit Russian media to channel one, you know, RTR Planeta, or uh, these traditional, let's say, the, the monsters <laughs> of propaganda. No, uh, they are not limited to television. They're everywhere. They're on Telegram, which is, again, there is so many controversies. Telegram was accused of being a, you know, in 2018, it peaked when they tried to ban Telegram, accusing it of being a terrorist uh, platform. And now Telegram is the place for Russian propaganda because of the politicians who abandoned Twitter or Instagram, having accused them of being uh, radical terrorist platforms. Now Telegram is being used actively. So we have to be aware of this conver convergence effect. Traditional and social media are not clearly distinct anymore. The lines are heavily blurred. There is an echo chamber effect caused by algorithmic filter bubbles, something that I would like to urgently emphasize here. When you open the feed, your feed and the news just jumps at you, what news are delivered 
as the top stories on the first page in the top 10, even if you consciously start seeking the news, is it Russian news? You know, is it uh, Ukrainian news? Is it Western news? Algorithms play a central role here. And Russian media is winning by its volume because it creates so many channels, because it penetrates through so many, uh, you know, ways, traditional and social. It can dominate online algorithmically so you try to debunk something you saw on tv you go online you still see the russian pro-russian pro-kremlin narrative vice versa you saw something online you think i'm gonna double check on tv you turn on the tv uh, and your pre you, and your <laughs> you, your uh, preconditioned values or understanding of reality is confirmed Propaganda through entertainment, whatever you want to call it, propertainment or entraganda, it's huge. It's huge in Russia. We might laugh at this. You know, some of you maybe will recognize these faces, yeah, these programs, these outdated people, these programs from 20, 30 years ago that are still alive, still shown on television, but they are presented as this golden collection, part of culture, unique media products, uh, games like uh, KVN. Yeah, it's the club for uh, fun, fun-loving people, but uh, it has turned into a propaganda machine. Or this wheel of fortune prototype, the uh, you know, field of miracles, polychidus. Again, it's shown every Friday. It's this ritual. People sit down, people watch it. And you would think it's just an entertainment show. But if you look at the guests who come to this show, uh, people from Donbass who are saying, together with Russia, we are power. Thank you for taking us. We have been suffering for eight years, you know, being bombed by fascists from Kiev. They perpetuate this narrative. They normalize it. There are certain mantra-like narratives coming from uh, the official Kremlin or approved by the official Kremlin. One of them is that nothing is happening. And the other one, everything is going according to the plan. And whatever we are doing is right. And all three are confirmed by these um, informal leaders that create a sense of normalcy for people. You know, this uh, New Year celebration is huge in the post-Soviet world. People can, you know, people invest into the New Year celebration. It's one of the biggest celebrations. And of course, you want to be entertained. You turn on the TV and everything is politicized. Every program is about the evil West how they are trying to steal our glory, our values. They try to you know, erode our values. And we are this holy nation, holy state with fantastic media products. And uh, you know, we are just saving the world. Uh, also, modern comedians, this stand-up culture in Russia had its momentum. And you would think that you know, stand-up being framed as the new rap would be rebellious, would challenge the status quo. But what we also observe is that stand-up comedians in Russia, uh, the, well, it's a divided camp. Some have departed from Russia, of course, and cannot return there. But others, predominantly, most of them remained in Russia, continue working on television and continue normalizing the status quo. We have the singers who are cruising around with concerts. There were a couple of vivid um, cases in Central Asia where people demanded, in fact, the cancellation of some of the Russian uh, concerts or uh, these mega festivals like Jara or Heat. But, but some, uh, some Putin lovers and endorsers still freely come and perform. And you know now that they're unable to perform elsewhere, let's say in Europe, uh, they found a new market in Germany, uh, in, sorry, in Central Asia uh, or in Turkey, in Antalya, you know. Uh, you also have these more r radical type of entertainers who are openly calling for the holy war, uh, calling Ukrainians with a slur terminology like Ukropi and so on, and basically calling for uh, genocide. There are social media groups, like I've mentioned, through ethnographic observations, through my ethnographic studies, I camp out on all social media networks. And one of them, which is kind of a trash can, is a swamp of a, of a uh, social media platform called Adnaklasniki Classmates. It's not taken seriously, just like all these programs, but it should be because it creates discourse for millions. Maybe 
people who refer to themselves as this intelligentsia, you know, who constitute five, ten percent. Uh, for them, it's embarrassing to even open Adnaklasniki. But for millions of other people, it is the source of information. It is huge. It's it's continuously, you know, number one, number two in Kyrgyzstan, number one, number two platform in Uzbekistan between Telegram and Vkontakte, which is another yeah, uh, Russian platform now. And we need to pay attention to this. We cannot just label this, oh, these are trash cans. No one should care about them. No one reads them. No, people read them. People get information from them. There are different types of nostalgic groups, of course. We were born in the USSR, you know. Uh, USSR is our motherland. We are nostalgic for the USSR. There are nostalgic groups. And once you start unpacking a bit of what is being said there, I will just show vivid examples. I mean, I cannot include everything. I can just create summaries and provide you with a few memes or a few vivid examples of the type of discourses that are presented there. So here is Vladimir Zhirinovsky, yeah? uh, this infamous Russian uh, parliamentarian who was in the Duma for 30 years until his death. And he, you know, he, here a quote is, why are you making your kids learn English? They should learn how the Kalashnikov is built. And then everyone in the world will speak Russian. Or these kinds of references that Putin did not start a single war, but he finished quite a few. And framing the war against Ukraine, Russia's uh, reinvasion or full scale invasion of Ukraine as something that uh, the West has provoked Russia to do. And Russia is there to finish something that was started by the West back in 2014. Again, quickly jumping through, and I, I apologize to everyone who might find these offensive, of course, but I have to sh treat them as media artifacts. Let's treat them as media artifacts. Let's put on our media scholar hats and treat them purely as such for now, uh, you know, because these, these are absolutely terrible. And I selected some that I, I've censored out quite a few, in fact, because there is there are open calls for genocide on, on Adnaklasniki. It's such an unmoderated <laughs> platform. And, you know, of course, here you have the Zip Patriots. You have the narrative that is akin to that approved by the official Kremlin that Zelensky is a drug addict sending over you know, mountains of cocaine. Uh, the difference between Russian troops and Ukrainian troops, Russian troops are protecting kids. Remember the nuances of good propaganda, the sentiment, the emotion. Children play a central role usually, while Ukrainians are hiding behind the strollers with children. This is a curious one. I'm on my own land. So again, this contradiction of narratives, like we don't want to colonize anyone, we are not there to capture any land, but then claiming that we are on our own land. Ukraine and kind of game of words here, Ukraine, cocaine, so West cocaine, Central cocaine, and then no more cocaine because Russia will capture it. Um, continuously comparing Zelensky to a fascist, disregarding his Jewish heritage and, you know, just a just this pure mockery, absolute idiotism, and reference also to Western experts or generally the moves of the West. So this one, for instance, says that uh, the Germans called Zelensky the new Hitler. Which Germans? Where are they? You know. <laughs> so this circulates on a, I wouldn't say on a daily basis, on on an hourly basis, on ev every minute gigabytes you know of garbage information like this are tossed on viewers also a curious one that goes in line with today's discussion on uh, hijacking anti-colonialism hijacking decolonization <laughs> there are racist narratives against migrants and against uh, you know people of color but then the eu is accused so let's look at this one we europeans do not need khakhli, which is a derogatory term to describe Ukrainians, in the European Union, stated a German citizen. Obviously, they're trying to mock here that Germany has Arabized to the point that everyone in Germany looks like this, which they find problematic, and that, you know, that nobody wants Ukraine as part of the European Union. 
So that without even understanding how racist they are, they then dare to call for anti-colonialism in the European Union, something I will show in a few moments here. Again, a racial bias. Here, this image reads, mom, dad, what is democracy? It is when white people work every day so that we can receive our welfare, a phone for every member of the family, uh, rent money, free food, coverage of the bills, etc. But mom, aren't they angry about it? Of course they are, but that's called racism. So using these kinds of things to, to anger people, saying that framing uh, people of color as those only who sit on welfare, those only benefiting from, from white people working. Again, basically open, free racism. Every day, these kinds of garbage is dumped. Uh, and then, of course, <laughs> there are the accusations of the EU and the US. So it's, it's quite the paradox then they are accusing Europe of being too tolerant on the one hand and then being racist on the other hand. So some, again, as I promised, these are just the snapshots. I have to move on for the sake of time. So I will just present to you this, the essence, yeah, this very concentrated uh, narratives, which are repeated the most. So there's an anti-West narrative, obviously, this is an obvious one. It's a demonization of the US and the European Union. There is also the anti-Ukraine narrative, artificially created state ran by Nazis. This is how they described Ukraine. And Russia has a unique position in the world. It is a holy state. It is a holy state with family values, with moral values, with the responsibility to protect. They're using this international law terminology. As far as Russia-Central Asia relations are concerned, it is a, the narrative in the media is the, that of a relationship between a parent and a child. There is a carrot and a stick. Russia is a giver and forgiver, but it can also punish. So Russia can give you grants. It can forgive you your debts. It can take your migrants, educate them. Russia is portrayed as a you know, country that enlightens. But on the other hand, if you demand too much of de-Sovietization, uh, they might punish you. What about Russian media in Europe? <laughs> uh, uh, about Europe? So unfortunately, European channels are limited in, in Central Asia. The connection is, you know, we like to toss around this word connectivity. Again, it's essential for Europe Central Asia uh, strategy, but it is a broken connection, I would say. And it is also a hijacked connection. There is so much work that is yet to be done, still to be done as far as exchange is concerned, as far as European Union presenting itself firsthand in Central Asia, as far as you know, these, all the things that are beneath the iceberg tip when it comes to human exchange. So homosexuality, even bestiality, an inevitable collapse of the European Union. So if you open the Russian news and if you type in yeah, you know, European Union, this is what you will see. There is a puppet in the West in the hands of the European in, in the hands of the United States. It is a place where you know there are only homosexuals running around. It is bestiality, even you know, people having sex with animals, and at least it will lead to an inevitable collapse. On the one hand, EU lost itself because of its tolerance. Yeah, we see this Arabization, Islamization of the EU. But on the other hand, it is accused of racism that they don't take migrants. You know, when there were all these cases with uh, Belarus flying in people from Iraq and trying to illegally send them to Europe, basically just manipulating people into this illegal migration, using them as meat, so to speak. Uh, it was the e European Union that was accused of racism. And once again, when we go, you know, some of these new aspects are true. There are people in, in Europe who are racist. There are people who are sharing the anti-immigrant sentiment. There are people who are sharing the anti-refugee sentiment. And Russia is weaponizing it very successfully. Also, the repackaged history narrative that Russia once again has to save Europe. That narrative didn't come around yesterday. It didn't come around on the 24th of February, 2022. That narrative has been... Uh, drilled into people's brains through, again, cartoons, through movies, through jokes, through, through all these informal media products, stories, through May 9th celebrations of victory in the Great Patriotic War. Uh, yeah, all these things that oh, we, motion yeah, we can repeat this, we can repeat this. Like mantra for 20 years, this was repeated. And now it doesn't seem so absurd to people when they are called on to repeat this. 
Also, the lost paradise narrative here, Russia has lost some land and that land must be reclaimed. Everything was fantastic. The Soviet Union was a perfect, beautiful place to live in. And then the evil capitalist West came to destroy it. There, and now we have to fix it. That lost paradise narrative is successfully sold to people. EU is a victim. So EU is on the one hand demonized, but on the other hand, it's portrayed as a victim because I, there is still hope that you know Russia can be influential in the EU. And again, domestically grown populists are only helping that. There are Putin lovers on the European soil in the European parliaments. Yeah, just look at the populist narratives across this continent or across the Union. And also, you know, the, the EU is dependent on Russia's gas, oil, and gold. And if the United States uh, is to leave Europe alone, Russia will gladly step in and once again, you know, get its re relations restored with Europe. Nuances, linguistic issues, again, running a bit quickly here, but for those who are not familiar with the terminology, so people in Kyrgyzstan want to be referred, want their country to be called Kyrgyzstan or the Kyrgyz Republic. Whereas Russia and Russian media are continuously using this term Kyrgyzia, which is a colonial term. And they are showing their power that no, we are not gonna use the terminology that you want us to use. We're gonna use the terminology that we are using from the past. You know, it's like, um, countries rename themselves yeah, it's like still using those old colonial terminology old colonial names just to show its own power uh other terminology that is being used is the cis the commonwealth of independent states or smg in russian yeah this entity has very little political power it's more symbolic but russia is using it successfully you know whether in the cis treating it as a common space it's a very important uh, political entity for propaganda in that case. Uh, and Russian language, of course, don't dare touch the Russian language. It is a language of education and enlightenment. There are virtue words that penetrate, that create historical taboos, the great patriotic war. You cannot touch it. You cannot debunk it. You cannot challenge the role of uh, the Soviet army in capturing lands. You cannot touch the you know, events that were developed after the victory when millions of people were accused of treason and you know, shot in the head. You cannot do that. You cannot touch this or debunk any of this myth. It's an untouchable myth, as is the friendship of the people, uh, that illusion that everyone lived in this uh, utopian state and were friends until, again, the evil West has come disregarding completely the Soviet history of uh, packing people based on their race in the um, cargo trains and tossing them around the country for weeks to then dump them in the middle of nowhere and have them build cities. Moral values and obligations, family values, all these terminologies being tossed around and sold to people successfully. Uh, direct threats also are used. So again, carrot and stick, these kinds of relations. Do you want to be the next Ukraine? So if you want to rename your streets from the Soviet to post-Soviet uh, to your own, uh, after your own heroes, we will treat it as a threat. We will treat it as Russophobia and we will come after you. Or we will punish you through other means, like we'll send back your migrants. Demonizing Ukraine and uh, recruiting people into Russian military, again, just a snapshot. Sputnik is an interesting entity. Usually, the first suspects that come to mind when you deal with Russian propaganda is Channel One, Pervi Canal, or RTR, uh, or VGTR Guide. It's a conglomerate of channels where all propagandists in chief, so to speak, perform uh, on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, I should say. Again, the content of the television is highly uh, politicized even entertainment. Uh, but people from Central Asia are manipulated into joining the war. The war is presented as an opportunity. So you find in the limited mobilization, again, they stress that it's limited, that it's not mass, or that it's, you know, that it's over even, even though it's not. And they manipulate people into joining. But what's interesting about Sputnik, real quick point. <laughs> if you go to Sputnik KG, which is the local agency in Kyrgyzstan, the homepage is in the Kyrgyz language, which is something that local 
critical media are struggling to do. Linguistic nuances are complicated in Central Asia, in, in Kyrgyzstan specifically. But Sputnik AG offers that. So on the one hand, they're doing something great. They're delivering news to people in Kyrgyz. Yeah? They're washing themselves off from the opportunity to accuse them of colonization. How can you accuse us of colonization? We present news in the Kyrgyz language. In fact, when you open Sputnik KG, the first title page is in Kyrgyz. Then you have to find the Russian version by clicking Rus, right? And it's vice versa on all domestic Kyrgyz platforms. How crazy is that? So what are the other narratives? Again, with the collective West, I'm showing you just some snapshots. The West uh, cannot demand from others to go along with its own values. So Putin is saying that Sputnik KG is delivering it to people. So again, framing the West as this evil conglomerate with values that are alien to Central Asia and as an imposer of values, while Russia is the protector. And here, huge are issues of morality, gender, and colonialism. So <laughs> with, with, uh, with gender specifically, yeah, framing these narratives land so nicely in the context where homophobia is on the rise and or it has always been around and in these conservative contexts and in this patriarchal contexts, it's landing nicely. And of course, Russia has done this uh, on its own turf by decriminalizing domestic violence. Yeah, you can beat your, your uh, wife twice a year in Russia and not suffer any consequences officially and also you can uh, you know this anti-gay propaganda laws that evolved now into basic ban on, on on homosexuality they also land nicely in central asia unfortunately going along with the increasing rise of conservatism demonization of the collective west again the u.s money is spent on teaching the youth how to overthrow the government uh i'll just leave it at that the new term that recently penetrated the public discourse in Russia is neo-colonialism. So they really, I feel like they, they understood what's going on and gave an order to launch this terminology and to frame the West as neo-colonialists. And now finding friends elsewhere in the world where this decolonial or neo-colonial narrative can land nicely, Russia is organizing this you know, round tables and conferences like the United Russia Party, which is a V party in Russia, yeah, uh, is going to fight with neo-colonialism and they're going to organize an international forum where, of course, people from former colonial, from countries that were formerly colonized are going to come and they will buy this narrative because it's a convenient one. And some of it is, in fact, true, right? There is a colonial past there is a colonial burden and it may be even present that uh, European countries carry along, but that narrative once again is hijacked by Russia and manipulated and weaponized, something that uh, it requires urgent attention of policymakers and media professionals. Uh, also, Mishustin is saving Russia from uh, digital colonization by the West. And that's an interesting one, because if they come to save Central Asian states as well, that means that the technology that's going to be brought in is going to be Russian or Chinese. And then, you know, we have to understand all the consequences of um, data regulation or lack thereof. Russophilia versus Russophobia. So a favorite thing to do for Russian media is to feature someone uh, in this case, this writer who is a princess, Princess Victoria Alita from uh, uh, Italy, uh, tried to do a bit of background research on her very limited information. I tried to found, find this quote in English or, you know, couldn't find it anywhere else. But basically, she said that uh, new forms of colonialism require Russophobia. So they're linking these two. And Russophobia is a term they have been using around for a while now to accuse the West or to accuse to accuse anyone who is willing to decolonize or de-Sovietize de of being a Rus phobe. And Russia is in fact organizing an international conference on uh, Russophilia. <laughs> and you can see here the movement on international uh, uh, Russophilia and President Putin congratulated the um, members, participants. 
Now, when when in Kyrgyzstan in Bishkek they tried they announced the parliamentarians discussed the possibility of renaming city districts in the capital of Bishkek that still carry the Soviet names. Uh, Russian media reacted aggressively and they called it derusification to the point that then the president of Kyrgyzstan had to assure them that everything is fine, nobody is going to derusify and we love the Russian language and we are going to continue being best friends with Russia if necessary for another 300 years. So summary, contradictions, yes, but that's part of the strategy. It appears as contradictions to us, all these uh, you know, different clashes of the narrative, but that's a tactic. You identify different uh, conglomerates, different groups, different people, and you deliver it to them. You can deliver to the far right in Europe. You can deliver to the far left. You can say capitalist system sucks. You know, let's restore communism uh, to some groups. You can say, let's keep the uh, migrants away to another group. And you can tell a third narrative to another group. You have no moral issues with that. You don't care. You're a propagandist. What you need to do is undermine the unity of the European Union, undermine the central values. Uh, because then if you undermine the values, you also undermine the institutions. And once you undermine the institutions and the values, you win. Russian media support European far right and then accuse Europe of being racist. That's part of the strategy. Russian media laugh at Europe for Arabization and Islamization. And then they accuse Europe of Islamophobia and neocolonialism. Russian media portray Russia as a loving and caring state. Yet any attempt to, call it to uh, decolonize and de-Sovietize uh, is taken with hostility and threats. Russia is hijacking the anti-colonial discourse to shield itself. I will repeat what I started with. Uh, now that maybe I have presented these cases, it will be a bit more uh, logical to present the statement once again. Russia is hijacking the anti-colonial discourse to shield itself from the colonial past. And in doing so, it maneuvers the anti-colonial narrative against the collective West. Uh, these narratives land nicely in Central Asia and with former colonies in South America and in, on the African continent. Perception, Russian, based on our focus groups with IWPR and uh, says UCAM, Russian media is valued for its perceived quality uh, based on focus group discussions in Kyrgyzstan. Russian media has a sentimental value to people. They share culture code. People say, you know, since childhood, I have been watching it and I just believe it. I trust it. It's kind of on, always on the background. Local media in Kyrgyzstan are perceived as, you know, those that belong to the state or to the oligarchs, they are perceived as either low quality or manipulative. Uh, whereas local media that are supported by Western countries, they are perceived as alien to the, to the local values, which echoes the Russian propaganda narrative, which means that it works. Russian media are perceived as native, so not as foreign media, but as domestic media. Again, we have to keep in mind the linguistic nuances here. Uh, local media in Kyrgyzstan have low credibility and independent media are perceived as spreading alien values and Western media that are available like BBC or um, your news people have voiced that they view them as Islamophobic. What to do? A couple, maybe a, a few action points, and I'm open to the discussion and your suggestions as well. Uh, invest in direct communication of what the EU is in Central Asia and vice versa. European Union needs to invest in its communicative strategy to deliver in Central Asia to explain who they are. And that doesn't just mean a Facebook post by the EU delegation. That, that, that's not how it works. You have to learn from the propagandists. You have to penetrate from a variety of uh, sources. Banning platforms like Adnaklasniki and Kontakti is probably impossible. People will find ways. I mean, you can do it, of course, but people will still find ways of uh, being there. You can, only, you can only reassure them their credibility to people who love conspiracies. They will say, oh, they're banning us. Less than we are definitely doing the right thing. So instead, they should be used as spaces to spread the alternative messages. Use these platforms. People are there in hundreds of uh, millions. People use these platforms to gain information. Start your message, your campaign on these platforms as well. Launch it. Debunk the propaganda. Rely on other on and offline outlets. 
empower local alternative content producers in countries like Kyrgyzstan, for instance, yeah, give them the opportunity to create content in a local language. There are so many creative people, they need resources and initiate an immediate conversation on the role of algorithms. This is a very important one. Algorithms serve a central role in what news penetrate people's uh, feeds. You open your phone, you get the news. How can algorithms be controlled or even used for debunking propaganda? Please feel free to stay in touch. I am an affiliate or an associate of uh, UCAM, and I volunteer to run this uh, podcast called Chat in the Yurt. Please listen to us if you have time. <laughs> feel free to state your questions or come as a guest into our yurt and let's drink some virtual tea together and converse. I'm looking forward to our discussion. I will stop right here. Yeah, I've, I see the first person who has a hand up. Uh, I think Camilla is the name. Yeah. Hello. Uh, can you can hear me. I'm the one to answer first. Uh, ask first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And Rashid, it's always nice to see you and to like. Even if I have a privilege to listen to many of those examples you've already said, but uh, there is one question I came up with. Uh, when we talk about all these things about propaganda and especially Central Asian states being vulnerable to Russian propaganda, we unfortunately face the opposite opinions of even some experts in our, like, it's very elitist to say, but in this expert communities and everything, who would say, why is it bad to have Russian propaganda and why do you consider Russia as propaganda state which intervenes in our own media spaces for so and has been doing this for a long how can you see like do you see the necessity to explain this to people like this or should there be just two different polarized views on the issue Maybe, Camila, first of all, fantastic to see you. <laughs> I think there are two streams of uh, action points here. On the one hand, we should domestically fight against this alienation from each other. You know, uh, I'm from Uzbekistan, but I'm very familiar with the context of Kyrgyzstan. I've lived there for five years. And, you know, there are these, it's vivid there because you have this vibrant civil society in Kyrgyzstan that are super active on Twitter. They, you know, there is this term even Balkonsky to describe the elite groups who live in inner city in cozy apartments who don't have shortages of, you know, gas, water, or whatever. Oh, even if they do, it's not to that extreme, like people in the periphery, let's say. So this gap needs to be bridged first domestically, of course. Um, but also, yes, people need that explanation because from what I understood in our research, Propaganda is not viewed as a negative term, it's viewed as a positive term, and there are the existing sentiments that we need more propaganda of our values, we need to work with kids, or this, some of these things are already there, this toxic, you know, approaches to dealing with, uh, let's say, gender roles, or with kids, kids need to be sent to this camp, or boys need to act this way, we need stronger military, we need our girls now, there are these huge discussions in Kyrgyzstan that girls should be sitting at home until they're 23 and not to travel abroad. Or if they do travel abroad, you need to talk to them. So constantly going back to this, I don't know, again, this um, restriction, this biased by gender roles and framing values as alien, it's the success of Russian propaganda. And it's landing on fertile turf because they, let's admit it, we were part of the Soviet Union. So we have that shared culture called absolutely. And therefore, the campaign to counter it, it cannot just be limited to an alternative message. Yeah, Russia is showing that Bucha was fake. We are going to show that Bucha was massacre or genocide. That, that should absolutely take place, but that's not enough alone. It has to deal with education, with teaching people the new threats of information. But how... I'm challenged here. Who are you going to give this advice to? To the government that is using you know, the media to uh, restrict opposition, to suppress dis the dissent and critical voices? You cannot suggest it to them. Uh, civil society is limited, so it, it has to be, I guess, suggested to the international donors. If you want to counter Russian propaganda in Central Asia, put the money where your words are, you know, and invest into creation of content, 
into education, it has to be simultaneous and granulated, and you know it has to be just a massive uh, movement. And by all means, it cannot be just focused on the elites in the center. It has to take a rural turn, absolutely. And when we say rural, I mean, look at our countries, but almost 50% of people live in the rural. 40, I will not remember concrete numbers, 47, 50, 51 in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, it's upward 60, I think. In Tajikistan, it's almost 70% of people living in the rural areas. Yes, you need to take this rural turn. Does anyone else have questions? But Camila, maybe you could also suggest something because, <laughs> you know, why, why is it me mansplaining here, please? Yeah, this is actually the question that have come out out of very big debate I've recently had in many chats of Central Asian analysts or whoever, where they would be trying to diminish the role and they would be trying not to like recall the facts by saying that, yes, there has been colonial rule. And even if, for example, Soviet uh, period was not classic empire, the one that we used to compare like a British empire or any other, they would still say no. And we still have this narrative, as you already mentioned, that the spirit has brought us so much. And for example, in fact, in uh, today in Kazakhstan, uh, 31st of May, this is a day of remembrance of victims of political repressions and also um, famine, which in Ukrainian is called a war. In Kazakh, we had a sharshluk, which are quite uh, similar tragedies. And there are people, and there are interesting thoughts that I'm reading about people trying to deny that there were no repressions, there were no genocide attempts, there were nothing, and things that we have now are okay. And being and seeing Russia as the only logical ally is something very reasonable. And this is also something very, uh, and this is also, I see this as one of the weakening factors for Central Asia to develop as a region. Because as you've mentioned, different countries are unfortunately exposed to propaganda in its different ways, for example. Um, and it also brings lots of risks and it also limits so many debates that can arise. Um, and since there is lack of consolidation, even within researchers and civil society members and also governments, uh, reaching those rural communities that you've mentioned, trying to help them on this I don't like this word, but geographically peripheries, trying to help them get some credible information uh, becomes even a bigger challenge when there are so many people to be uh, like who strongly believe that it's not a war, that there was no invasion, that things are okay. And as you've mentioned, for example, Bucha and Mariupol and everything is just Ukrainian uh, propaganda and the same that what we're having now about this Russian drones uh, it's also became one of those tools to show that no it's Ukrainians and yeah which is also very I see no answer for this <laughs> as well but these are the trends that we see currently in our societies and they are developing very rapidly I would say exactly and plus you know look at our history books right look at the literature that we read and the, all the schools that are the so-called russian schools when you go to russian schools whose portraits are hanging on the walls what kind of history you're learning that all penetrates from that already the golden collection of soviet movies again this mantra that we're conditioned to perceive as, as fantastic and wonderful movies what values penetrate through them and of course, I always, I always like these kind of personal experiences. You know, when we met recently in Almaty, I flew into Kazakhstan, right? I got get into taxi and I have this small conversation with the taxi driver. And I love conversations with taxi drivers in Central Asia because it's kind of a the radar for what's going on in the region, right? They talk to a lot of people, so they're a source of information as well. And he's asking, so why what, what are you coming here for? I said, this uh, uh, decolonization conference. He says, like, what is decolonization? And I started explaining it to him that, you know, is our focus is on Russia's uh, role as a colonial power in Central Asia. He said, and he was disappointed that, that, no, no, we are not, you know, we were not a colony. We were members of a fantastic state. That echoes there, of course, of course, and, and Russia is instrumentalizing it. So I think we need, we need to gain an understanding, a strategy, and that only can be done through the conversation. So when we organize the next meeting like that, we should be in the rural areas. 
think we have uh, one more question in the chat, if you can see it. Or should I just read it out? If yeah, that would be nice. Uh, yeah, okay. So the first question says, uh, thank you for the very interesting lecture. With all that you've talked about in mind, um, the deep implementation of Russian propaganda in Central Asia, the threats of economic and social utilitarianism, etc. Is there any chance for the EU to succeed in changing that narrative and help these countries escape the Rus Russian sphere of influence? We've seen EU officials and some state leaders like Macron pay more attention to the region since February 2022, but is, uh, is it too little too late? Nice, yes, it's always too little too late, but at least something is happening. One thing I'm afraid of here is that a lot of things will be neglected in Central Asia just for the sake of, again, appeasing the, appeasing the leaders. So for instance, saying, hey, be friends with us, trade with us, trade with the European Union, don't be friends with Russia, be friends with us. But because of that, we will also not criticize you too much. Yeah, when you repress your journalists, when you throw them out of the country, when you imprison people illegally, uh, detain them for what they have posted online, when you adopt Russia's laws. What I in what I see right now, yeah, and it's again, I represent only my personal opinion, nobody else's. I see Central Asian leaders tricking the European Union, saying, yes, everything is fantastic, we will do this, then adapting exactly the draconian laws that Russia is adopting to suppress civil society, to install an absolute control over the media domain, and in doing so to maintain economic ties with Russia. So short-term personal political ambitions are prioritized by them even if on the scale, on the other side, there is uh, the future of the country of statehood, they don't, they don't care about that. And in the meantime, yeah, the European side is buying this, this trick, is what I see, unfortunately. What needs to be done is that the media domain needs not be neglected. It's beneath that iceberg tip once again, but it's not obvious to many people, unfortunately. Uh, you know, look at what Russia is doing media-wise and without turning into everything you're fighting against, try to counter that maybe on some of the same platforms like I've mentioned there. Yeah? Uh, be more present, be more trust, trustful towards the, the people of Central Asia. You know, when you say, let's build closer ties and then it's impossible to get a visa to even come to Europe, that's not closer ties. You need to build these people-to-people -people exchanges have more education-focused exchanges, journalism-focused exchanges, empower civil society. Don't neglect Central Asia and then be surprised of what's happening. Yeah? And now, when there is this renaissance of attention, also don't be fools. Yeah? Don't be fools. Don't be tricked. And yeah, uh, focus on, the, on what's important beneath the iceberg, the not-so-obvious things that actually matter the most. Okay, thank you for the answer. Um, the next question in the chat is, uh, if there's any advice you can give on how to start to talk with elders, parents, family members who are so racified and uh, been under propaganda their whole life um, and think of themselves as more wise because of the age difference and cultural aspects of it. If only I had this remedy, if only I had it, I would, uh, I would, it would be so amazing. Yeah. Most of us, I think, face this. Lots of families I spoke with even in Ukraine have this uh, the way you cannot talk to each other anymore because they're so sold to propaganda. They're so manipulated. They have, yeah, their body is made of, <laughs> of the molecules of and atoms of Russian propaganda. It's amazing. And it's impossible to start the conversation when they start repeating to your arguments with a mantra from television. You suddenly feel like you're not talking to your grandma, but you're talking to Solovyov uh, because she successfully absorbed everything he had to say. Yeah, this is what, you know, to put it simply, we are facing on a daily basis. And if you try to educate people, they will only perceive you as somebody who has uh, gone bonkers, who has converted to the evil Western plot, to the narrative. So for me, it's difficult to answer this question. First, if others in the group have personal experiences or suggestions, uh, please do. I only share my personal uh, experiences and what I have been trying to do, you know, all these family chats. <laughs> it's like, you cannot just suddenly attack it with news, but now and then kind of 
discreetly present an alternative version, a screenshot of some headline. You know, don't share a link because they will not click on the link, uh, but share a headline, maybe a picture, a screenshot. Slowly start exposing them. Be a be killjoy now and then. That's another important thing. Sometimes we're afraid to be killjoys to say, well, we're just family. Let's just all agree. Sometimes maybe you need to, to disagree and, and have that conversation. Um, and then just also in the meantime, protect yourself. Sometimes it's so frustrating and so impossible and so late. And again, I'm not, yeah, it's not a psychologist's advice, just a personal one that you should not forget to take care of your own self in the middle. In the meantime, you cannot fix people, focus on your own well being, and, you know. <laughs> And move on. If but again, if the group has uh, any suggestions, please do. Does anyone uh, want to add to that? Or um, I think I see like someone clapping hands, but I think that was probably a reaction to your answer. Um, so yeah, if there are any more questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Or a contribution doesn't have to be a question comment uh yeah this is an open discussion so great to see uh all these names let's have a <laughs> if you want to contribute something please do ah oh, there's a hand <laughs> okay you can start yeah rashid thank you for your lecture it was really interesting nice to see you um, I just uh, want to share an experience and ask a question. Um, I usually, when I talk to my father, he's also propaganda, Russian propaganda kid. And I always uh, bring up this uh, colonial past of Uzbekistan, of uh, invasion of Russian empire to Central Asia, massacre of the local population. And then he starts to alienate from Russian propaganda and admit that it was like cruel times and but uh, it's and I, my question is how would you evaluate uh, these uh, subjects in Uzbekistan like uh, idea of national independence uh, also it it was it also like propaganda subjects but more like pro independence but uh, what i what i see is uh, students are not perceptive of these subjects, like they disregard it, as they uh, see it as something backward, and Russian sources as something like more developed. So how do you evaluate the impact and whether it counters the Russian propaganda? Thanks. Also wonderful to see you, Nuridin, and thank you for sharing that personal story. Yeah, sometimes I guess it's important to remind uh, people of the darkest part of the Soviet experience and so that they wake up a bit. As far as the Uzbek case is concerned, that's an interesting one because Karimov, you know, the leader until 2016, until his death, basically, he used the golden opportunity of the 90s where, you know, Yeltsin was inadequate and would not do anything if you he used this as a golden opportunity to de-sovietize yeah renaming all streets all stations everything was de-sovietized attempts to, to switch from Cyrillic to Latin alphabet all these moves were made in the let's say golden opportunity time where Russia was inadequate uh, for everyone's good probably <laughs> enough not to intervene and at the same time, yeah, there are some things that we can praise him for. Let's not forget he was a brutal dictator and he did some awful things as well. So we need to ask ourselves these questions. Who did he de-Sovietize for? To, for us, for citizens of Uzbekistan or for his own presidency? I would argue that it was done for, the, for his own presidency. So some of the things he has done are great, but uh, they were done to perpetuate his own rule and uh, everything that came along with it. You are fighting colonialism and Soviet past on the one hand, but through your own rule, through your own laws, you are also reestablishing the Soviet Union by creating these exit visas, not being suspicious of people, creating the KGB-like entity that you know monitors everything. You 
destroy one and you become exactly everything you're fighting against. So that is something that happened in Uzbekistan, unfortunately. But at the same time, I'm really happy that all these Lenin statues were teared down. We don't have Dzerzhinsky and all these other murderers, uh, you know, who, who we call our streets after and so on. And also how it's done is important because when you just rename the streets after someone who people are not familiar with, there is inertia. Yeah, so in Namangan, for instance, some streets people still call Leninsky Prospect, just because the new name doesn't mean anything to them. So when you de-Sovietize and you create a new name, maybe it shouldn't be someone from a 15th century. Yeah? Maybe it should be someone fresh who people can identify and respect. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, is there anyone else who, who would like to speak? Okay, it probably doesn't look like that. Yeah. <laughs> People exiting frantically. Where is the exit button? Anyway, <laughs> so lovely to connect with everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for holding the lecture. We are really happy to, to have had you here. And also thank you to the Central Asian Rupana and Tatiana there for, um, for co-organizing that with us. It was a really interesting topic and uh, lecture.